And with that, I will now turn it over to uh, Muhammad Al Yahya. Thank you for joining us. You know, I'd like to start uh, uh, by talking about uh, my experience doing track two discussions uh, with Iranian track two representatives. I've done about eight of them, uh, and they were uh, across Europe, uh, and they were very interesting uh, experiences for me. I'd been uh, studying the, the Saudi-Iranian relationship, the U.S.-Iranian relationship, U.S.-Gulf relationship for a while, but being um, having that experience of being in the room with people uh, uh, that know the regime firsthand in Iran, that in some cases represent the regime to, to a large extent, uh, and spending two days with them in, in, in a room uh, with uh, you know, a neutral European patron slash arbiter taking notes in the back of the room and trying to guide a discussion left and right, I discovered some 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 very interesting things, uh, and that is, you know, namely that, that you know there are many lenses through which to look at what is deemed the Iranian threat, uh, and there are ma there are many uh, frameworks through which to perceive Iran uh, in general, uh, and there is a very uh, pronounced disparity between uh, the lenses used in Western capitals and in, in, in the United States, even among uh, more hawkish actors against Iran and. Uh, the lenses that are used in the region. It's almost like two different languages. Uh, you know, the most frustrating of these track tools was me looking at two sides of the debate, literally arguing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a very rowdy way, but in two different languages. Nobody understood what the other side is saying. They're using different tools. They're using different variables. So I found myself towards the end of these experiences acting uh, somewhat like uh, an opinionated translator, trying to break down what the crux of the discussion is on each side was. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, after speaking with uh, Professor Masoud, uh, we decided to look a little bit at, at how these lenses to which Iran is viewed differ, uh, these languages, so to speak, you know, what are their characteristics uh, uh, and, and how we might better bridge this, this, these different modes of, of, of uh, looking at Iran. And that will require, first of all, I guess, unpacking them to the best of our ability. And second, uh, I'll inject a little bit of my opinion on, on what I think is going on. Um, first of all, I would say that there is a fundamental difference in what the quote-unquote uh, Iranian threat uh, uh, perception is. Uh, if you look at the P5 plus 1 and, and on a very basic level, the difference between how the P5 plus 1 look at uh, uh, Iran and how the regional actors look at Iran uh, uh, can be made uh, clearer in, in, in this example. Every single country that is in, within range of Iran's ballistic missiles, uh, whether they're medium, long range, or short range, uh, or Iran's militias, uh, where they have significant uh, uh, presence, uh, were not included in uh, the nuclear deal negotiations. No, uh, Saudi Arabia wasn't included. Uh, uh, the rest of the Gulf countries weren't included. US allies like Israel weren't included. So this was a security agreement. Uh, admittedly, it was a nuclear focused security agreement. Uh, but it is one where uh, those most at risk uh, in terms of security uh, from Iranian uh, expansionism or Iranian aggression were not included in the discussions, but were included more or less as an afterthought uh, in these discussions. Um, and that, that takes us more towards uh, uh, how the Iranian threat is, is uh, perceived in these circles. I remember... Um, during the, the days where the, the Iranian deal uh, was uh, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussed and was all over the media before it was signed in Geneva, um, there was definitely an aspect uh, in the advertising of the deal, whether it's by Ben Rhodes or, or by President Obama himself, uh, a part of this advertising or marketing campaign for the deal had to do with bringing Iran out of the cold. I mean, this is verbatim, you know, some quotes by President Obama would say Iran would be uh, something along the lines of a, a responsible state actor, come back in from the cold. This is the first stepping stone in order to create a more lasting peace. Of course, it's a limited deal, but there's more to come. That soon uh, proved to be uh, false. Uh, what we saw is that Iran stepped up its uh, uh, activities across the region. Uh, they doubled down on ethnic cleansing and genocide in Syria. Uh, they continued uh, to weaken the central government in Iraq and create, uh, you know, an, a, a failed state in one of the most uh, oil-rich countries in the world. You know, a failed state of, of unprecedented proportions. There, they continued to double down on Hezbollah, expanded towards Venezuela. Their international drug trade was at its height, 
and I'd like to remind everyone that it was around that time when Project Cassandra, which was uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, State Department uh, project or, or State Department DOD uh, project that aimed to clamp down on Hezbollah's, uh, sorry, it's a DA, DA project, uh, not a, not a project. It, uh, aimed to clamp down on Hezbollah's drug trade, just that aspect of Hezbollah's work. Uh, and former uh, uh, Obama officials testified before Congress saying that this was tamped down on. Tamped down on is the exact uh, uh, terminology that they used uh, in order uh, uh, to improve the chances of the Iran nuclear deal, in order not to affect uh, adversely the chances for, for a successful signing of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, there's another uh, example in Syria. You know, many, many uh, point at Syria and say that uh, the reason for U.S. inaction uh, in Syria, to a large extent, was uh, 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 you know um, uh, influenced by the Obama administration's almost tunnel vision on, on signing a deal in Geneva. Uh, I recommend a friend of mine uh, a book that a friend of mine wrote called "The Iran Wars." Jay Solomon, who was uh, in, in, uh, uh, the foreign correspondent of the Wall Street Journal, extensively talked about the relationship between the JCPO, JCPOA uh, negotiations and uh, the Iran deal. Uh, so, so um, the idea. Uh, the difference, the fundamental difference, I would say, is that 80%, the lens in the Gulf uh, that views the Iranian threat is focused 80% on Iran's expansion in the region, its militias across the region. These are things that people experience on a daily basis uh, that affect people's lives on the region on a daily basis, whereas Iran's nuclear uh, ambitions never really uh, uh, affected people on a daily basis. Uh, and that, that's the fundamental difference uh, between the two. An example of that is in Lebanon. You know, once uh, you visit Lebanon, um, before the war, uh, it used to look like a very different place. The southern, southern part of Beirut, Dahia, used to look like a very different place. Uh, uh, southern Beirut, uh, in its entirety, indeed, looked like a very uh, different place. It was very difficult to walk down the street and differentiate between people uh, in terms of their sect or religion. You wouldn't be able to tell if somebody walking down the street was a Sunni, a Christian, uh, a Maronite, uh, uh, Druze or a Shia. You know, people generally look the same. Uh, socioeconomic statuses didn't really differ uh, 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 in a very pronounced way among different sects. Uh, today, what's happening is that there is almost self-rule by Hezbollah among uh, uh, the Shia populations, especially in the south, maybe less in, in places like al and Hirmil, where there is still some, some uh, uh, degree of, of uh, uh, you know, independence, uh, if you will. Uh, today, they, people dress differently. People speak Arabic. You can see people speaking Arabic with sort of an Iranian accent. Uh, even the, 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 the abayas that people wear, the covers that people wear, are not, not Arabic style ones, but ones that more resemble a chador. So there is a cultural difference in that country, uh, uh, which is, which is uh, uh, a discussion on its own, on the side. But there is also a socioeconomic difference between these areas and the other areas of Lebanon. The fact that Hezbollah, for political purposes, exercises this uh, influence, uh, uh, of course, uh, at, the, at the behest of the Iranians and, and under the control of the Iranians, of all of the Shia areas, disadvantage the Shias that are living in Lebanon. The same can be said really of, of uh, those in Iraq and elsewhere in the region. So this is something that, that people uh, uh, see on a daily basis uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, think about on a daily basis in the region, much less than, than purely the, 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 the nuclear aspect. So essentially, um, um, again, so, so if, if when, when I was in Washington during 2015 and 2016, uh, uh, while the Iran deal was, was being negotiated and after, directly after it was signed, I remember uh, uh, you know, joining some panels on Yemen. Uh, and at that point in time, when one would mention that uh, the Iranians were backing uh, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, people would laugh in the audience, and people would treat whoever said something like that, like uh, they're a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists. This is ridiculous. You know, the, there's no evidence for this. When in fact, you know, the Iranian relation with, with the Houthi movement and its predecessor movement, the Shabab al movement, started in 1984. Uh, when this is this is that's a whole other argument. But I mean, it, it was a political uh, uh, intersection rather than a, a, a religious one. Uh, true, they are not 12ers. You know, a lot of instant uh, experts on Yemen came out and said that there could be no relationship between the Houthis and the Iranians because they are 12ers in Iran and they are not 12ers. The Zaydis in Yemen are not 12ers. Uh, true, that's, that is true, but it was the Iranian revolutionary textbooks uh, that gave uh, a very rigid and, and uh, you know, well thought out worldview 
uh, to be taught in schools and universities, etc., uh, that uh, was adopted by by Hussein Badr al-Din Khouti and Muhammad Hussein Farid, the head of the predecessor movement, the Shabab movement. It was those very Iranian revolution textbooks that were thought, and they weren't religious textbooks. They weren't convert textbooks. Uh, but it was uh, uh, about uh, this worldview and view towards the region. That takes us to our second point. Uh, during uh, the negotiation for the JCPOA, uh, there was a, uh, an interview of President Obama in uh, uh, the Atlantic, where he urged actors in the region to share the region. Um, and that takes us to the next point, which is the characterization of, of the, the conflict with Iran that took a very sharp turn during the JCPOA. Uh, it was characterized as a 1,400-year-old irrational struggle between uh, Saudi Arabia on one side and then the Iranians on the other side, and that you know the United States and other Western actors were uh, you know, a removed and isolated third party that never really had to involve themselves in the struggle, and that the best way to deal with it was to uh, withdraw from the region and allow the people in the region to share it among themselves and find their own equilibrium. And this was a problematic. Uh, uh, you know, characterization of what happened for various reasons. Chief among them was that it, it was completely false, uh, uh, but also that it served other purposes that we'll get to. Um, Saudi Arabia, there is no real Iranian Saudi Arabian struggle. You know, if you were to go to Riyadh and ask people in Riyadh, what is Saudi Arabia's main national security threat? Inevitably, invariably, you would hear that it is Iran. It is Iran's uh, influence over the Houthis and it's Iran's uh, oversight of ballistic missiles uh, being lobbed into Saudi Arabia by the Houthis, they would point to Hezbollah, they would point to the Hashim militias in Iraq. There would be a long list. You know, that's a very easy answer to get. If you were to go to Iran and ask them what the biggest national security threat to Iran is, invariably, you would hear that it's either the United States or Israel or both. Nobody would tell you that uh, uh, the main threat to Iran is Saudi Arabia. In fact, Iran is not in Iraq to reclaim any influence from Saudi Arabia. It's not in Syria to reclaim any influence uh, from Saudi Arabia. I would venture to say it's not even in, in, in uh, Lebanon to reclaim uh, any influence from Saudi Arabia. What Iran is trying to do in these places is reclaim uh, influence from what it perceives, uh, or, or, or not reclaim influence, to, to upend what it perceives as a US-led regional order. So this is primarily uh, uh, a problem between the United States uh, and between uh, Iran. And it started when the Iranian regime or when the revolution took hostage uh, uh, hundreds of Americans in the U.S. Uh, embassy in 1979. It's been that same problem forever. I remember uh, you know, highlighting this point in one of the attractive discussions I was in where I mentioned to one of um, the more uh, vocal and well-connected Iranians that were in the room. I said, uh, uh, you know, what if uh, Saudi Arabia severed its relations with Western countries tomorrow? What if Saudi Arabia were to cut off its relations with uh, the United States uh, and Europe? Uh, and uh, uh, focus uh, eastwards, let's say. Would that change the uh, uh, dynamic with uh, Iran? And his response was exactly this. He said, uh, 100%, we have no issue with Saudi Arabia, except for the fact that it's an agent of this Western US imperialism, and that's pretty much it. So, so again, the, I think one of the most damaging frameworks that was introduced into the public discourse on the Middle East uh, conflict with Iran uh, was that it was one where the United States or uh, Western European countries can view themselves as a neutral and removed third party uh, to an irrational struggle that pre-existed their influence in the Middle East. It didn't. This is not an, uh, a fundamentally a problem between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and Iran. It is fundamentally a problem between the West and Iran. Whether the West wants to play a role in this is secondary to the fact that these are the parties that involve. And uh, 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 the Iranian objectives uh, in its uh, proxy building uh, uh, and in its uh, uh, escalation in the region is to upend what it perceives uh, to be a Western-led uh, regional order and the Western-dominated order. One where it views Saudi Arabia as a client of that order uh, uh, and not uh, uh, the, uh, the priority uh, target, as it were, uh, in the conflict. So that, that's another uh, problematic uh, way that this, this conflict is viewed. Um, now I'll try to get back to, to more uh, contemporary issues. What we've seen with the Trump administration is that, uh, uh, you know, there was a complete reversal of everything that uh, President Obama uh, achieved with Iran, whether for better or for worse, it was just a blanket reversal. Uh, maximum pressure was applied on uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, and 
there was a large degree of um, uh, oversimplification in, in uh, the Washington and, and U.S. discourse on, on uh, what Trump is doing. Again, you know, uh, Trump is a very polarizing figure. Uh, you know, as, as neutral third-party watchers of U.S. politics, we see that this is a large, uh, uh, this is a very pol polarizing uh, topic, and there's a lot of craziness going on in the media, but. This uh, media situation in the United States took a toll on more sober and, and effective discussions on what's happening with Iran in light of Trump's uh, uh, policies. Uh, what we're seeing right now is that uh, the maximum pressure campaign uh, is putting Iran in a corner uh, and causing Iran uh, uh, to reroute resources. So, so, so essentially, the title of this talk says that lifting sanctions on Iran is the nuclear option. Uh, to answer that, or to explain that uh, in short form, uh, you know, depriving Iran of the uh, resources it needs to fund a bloated regional proxy network uh, is an essential part uh, of dealing with Iran. It's the cornerstone, it's the, it's the foundation of how one should deal with Iran if you ask actors in the Gulf. Uh, Iranian regime needs uh, U.S. dollars to fund uh, dozens and dozens of militias in Iraq, uh, many of which it exercises complete control over, and others uh, uh, over which it, uh, it exercises considerable control. In Syria, it's got uh, militias of Fatimi Yun and Zainab Yun fighters, which are uh, Shia fighters from Pakistan and Afghanistan. These fighters have literally flown or bust into Syria uh, from Iran or from Afghanistan uh, and asked to fight alongside the forces of Bashar al-Assad and Hezbollah forces, uh, the Lebanese Hezbollah forces. Uh, in many cases, you find that these uh, fighters turn up without any ability to be trained. So they, they're put into camps and, and resources are low, so they can't feed them. A lot of them starve to death because sending them back over to Iran or to Afghanistan is too costly, whether by bus or whether to airlines. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah is uh, suffering and uh, you know, the stimulus packages that uh, Iran used to send to Hezbollah periodically uh, are much smaller or even even uh, eliminated as a result of these uh, uh, sanctions. So so in order to, to, to fund this network, which Iran really has grown to unprecedented proportions after uh, 2011, uh, it needs U.S. dollars. It can't do so with, with uh, Iranian rials. It can't do so with uh, uh, currency from any other Middle Eastern country. It needs cold, hard cash uh, and the U.S. kind. So, so the fact that uh, it is deprived from access to that cash today is uh, uh, limiting its ability to exercise influence uh, over these uh, militias and putting it in a position where it really has to uh, reroute its focus uh, uh, inwards, especially uh, considering that there is unprecedented mass unrest in the country, probably uh, uh, you know, second only to, to the revolution that removed the Shah from power in 1979. So, so in the region, limiting Iran's abilities to fund its regional proxy networks is, is uh, the, uh, the priority. Uh, and I must say, you know, I think uh, President Trump's maximum pressure campaign on Iran is working. It's not perfect, of course, but it is working by and large. I can't hear you. Uh, it's by and large working. If, if we recall uh, how things happened uh, in the region, um, I've got a list here. Escalation. Yes, right here. So ships were uh, sabotaged on May 12, 2019. On June 19, 2019, Iran shot down a U.S. military drone, said it was Iranian territory. Uh, the U.S. Central Command said the claim was false. It was in international airspace. Uh, uh, on July 19, uh, IRGC seized the British flag tanker Stina Impero. Uh, and uh, that was two weeks after Britain detained an Iranian tanker of the state of Gibraltar. So, after that, uh, uh, two Saudi Arabian oil facilities are attacked uh, by 25 drones and cruise missiles, and I can get into um, uh, how that attack happened. It's a very interesting technology that actually is very alarming for many actors in the region. Uh, and then in October, um, uh, Shia uh, militia allies attacked the U.S. Uh, embassy in Baghdad, again after uh, uh, the United States attacked uh, Kitab Hezbollah and killed his several uh, high-ranking members. But the point out of all this, I'm not going to go through this entire list, is that since the maximum pressure cam campaign was mounted on Iran, uh, what we seem to see from the Iranian side was uh, this commitment to incremental, rational, uh, a limited escalation that was meant to test the waters and to see uh, where exactly the limits of the United States was. 
and the point of that escalation, uh, I think, is is uh, uh, to to attach a cost to the United States maximum pressure campaign such that uh, it becomes a little bit too risky, and then they can push the United States to lift sanctions or to make some concessions uh, that are beneficial to the regime in Iran. The response by the Trump administration has been to ignore uh, these sanctions. In fact, no. Uh, uh, so during some of these escalations, the response by the United States was to uh, sanction the central bank or sanction regime figures in the IRGC or that sanction people that, uh, uh, that have to do with Khamenei. Never did the United States give uh, the Iranian regime what it sought to achieve as a result of these incremental escalations, which is an easing of sanctions or a backdoor. Uh, although there, there were offers for uh, talks that were rejected by Iran. Um, even when the attack came on uh, Saudi Arabia, Saudi oil facilities, uh, uh, there was no response by the Saudis, uh, and there was no response by the Americans. The Americans said, "If the Saudis want me to respond, I'm more than ready to respond. I'm more than ready to, to uh, respond to these attacks." And I think this is emblematic of something very important. I think it's true that the uh, Trump administration doesn't want war, uh, and I think it's true. It's definitely true that regional actors like Saudi Arabia didn't want war. If you look at the discourse at that point in time in the United States, you know, headlines would say things along the lines of the UAE and Saudi Arabia are trying to egg on. Donald Trump to go to war on behalf of them. You know, uh, the Saudis want to fight the Iranians for the last uh, soldier. This was all completely false. Uh, uh, regional actors, especially in the Gulf, uh, uh, the last thing that they would want is war. But there are two realities that can exist simultaneously, and this is what people have been missing uh, in mainstream discourse in the US. You can be a total proponent of uh, uh, depriving the Iranian regime of the resources that it needs in order to wage war in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, and Lebanon, etc., while not being a proponent for US military intervention or the outbreak of conventional war that will inevitably be uh, a huge blow to the economies and to the people uh, of the region. These two realities can exist side by side. And if uh, we accept that they can exist side by side, then suddenly the policies of uh, the United Arab Emirates Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, other countries in the region start to make much more sense. Uh, you know, I remember one headline said, you know, after after the Coast Guard, the United Arab Emirates met with the Coast Guard in Iran. This was, uh, uh, you know, a continuation of periodic meetings that were uh, dropped, I think, or cut off for a couple of years. Uh, the point was, the, the headlines used to say that, uh, you know, this is a departure, a Marathi departure from uh, uh, the Saudi position of escalating towards war. Again, there is no escalation towards war. Uh, nobody wants war. A testament to that is the fact that the Saudis uh, did not respond when, when uh, the attacks happened on the oil facilities. And going back to, to, to this incremental escalation, the point is that you know, this strategy is one where uh, uh, pressuring Iran economically uh, serves two purposes. And they are the same, but they're different. First purpose is to pressure the Iranian regime to reconsider its uh, policies uh, and enact real change that's sustainable, uh, that brings more peace to the region. The second is to simply deprive it of the resources that it needs to, to enact the policies. It's known that the Iranians will try to attach a cost to this, will try to sabotage this by creating fireworks in the region, by provoking the region. The smartest thing to do, uh, and this is after speaking to officials from the United States and elsewhere, and this is something I agree with, I think, uh, is to ignore these things. If they do not cross certain uh, uh, sacred red lines, just ignore it. There is going to be uh, acting out, there is going to be lashing out, uh, but there are already tangible results from, from uh, depriving the Iranians of these resources that are seen across the region. Uh, what happened after the killing of uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, was very interesting. Uh, after the Trump administration uh, chose to uh, ignore everything in incremental escalation, uh, the Iranians went to the next logical step. And this is a discussion I had with, with several people in, uh, in the policy community about a month before uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani. I said, you know, the only logical next step for the Iranians is either to uh, kill an American serviceman or an American or to take hostage uh, uh, Americans. Because, you know, uh, attacking 5% uh, of the world's oil supply is, is pushing it. If we, get, if we get no response for that, then, then there's only so much you can do to escalate. And also, you know, President Trump has a habit of uh, putting uh, his entire foreign policy up for everybody to see on Twitter. So he said on Twitter that the red line is to kill uh, American servicemen, or to kill an American, or to harm Americans. So, so it was very clear to the Iranians, just by, by scrolling through uh, Donald Trump's Twitter feed to understand exactly what 
Donald Trump wants to avoid, what Donald Trump's uh, reputation in the United States and internationally is attached to protecting US citizens. And they did so. And the, the, the American response at that point in time uh, was, was to take out the most important uh, figure in the Iranian regime, the engine of Iran's regional proxy network, along with his main lieutenant, and symbolically take out that person outside the Iranian soil, which I think is very important for many reasons. You know, if the United States were to choose to attack uh, uh, Iran, the 52 targets or whatever they were that were inside Iran, I think that, that that's something that would backfire. That's some, this is a discussion I had again with, with somebody in the policy community before then. Um, you know, if Iranians die as a result of uh, uh, that attack, uh, there could be a rallying around the flag effect. Uh, the regime uh, probably would care very little that Iranians uh, died in the attack and would utilize such an attack for its own uh, consumption. Uh, attacking Iranian uh, uh, militiamen and warlords outside Iran, however, uh, you know, removes uh, uh, that risk. Uh, first of all, why? What is Qasem Soleimani doing outside Iran? Is a good question to ask. It is not an attack on Iran itself. It's an attack on Iran's regional proxy infrastructure, uh, and it's an attack on Iranian uh, lieutenants, all of whom have American blood on their hands and have the blood of innocent people in the, in the Arab world. On their you know, that, I think, caused uh, a very big uh, recalculation on the Iranian spot. Um, you know, any uh, escalation by the United States uh, has to actually cause harm to the ruling establishment in Iran for it uh, to be able to cause them to, to recalculate and recalibrate uh, their position. If it's a symbolic attack, what they do is they uh, attack again, try to incrementally escalate in such a way that they attach a higher cost. But when uh, the U.S. retaliation means uh, a huge um, obstacle and, and derailment, if you like, of their regional plans, uh, uh, that's when it makes a huge difference. And I'll just explain why uh, this is important, why Qasem Soleimani is, is, is very important. Qasem Soleimani, okay, in order for a militia in the region to survive, it needs uh, uh, three things. Uh, it needs uh, U.S. dollars and equipment uh, and guns. Uh, it needs uh, an ideology, uh, and it needs a leader who's both tactically uh, capable and charismatic and able to lead. Uh, Qasem Soleimani was the facilitator of all of these three things, and he was two of them. He was the charismatic leader that knew the head of every single militia in the Levant, that knew the, name of the, uh, the names of the sons and daughters of every single militia in the Levant. People used to uh, view him as a father figure, whether it was uh, within Hezbollah, or within uh, militias in Iraq or with the militias in Syria, the power of that kind of soft power, that kind of charisma among these militias has a huge value that one cannot attach uh, a price to. Uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how these militias, and this militia structure rather, would fare after uh, uh, the demise of, of uh, Qasem Soleimani. And the other part is, of course, his tactical prowess. Uh, Qasem Soleimani was a very... Uh, capable uh, general in proxy building, quick proxy building, uh, uh, set up, uh, uh, setting up the hierarchy, uh, uh, logistics. I mean, they, under the leadership of Qasem Soleimani, uh, uh, the Quds Force and the Revolutionary Guard brought uh, proxy building and militia building and building meaningful horizontal relationships with other proxies, whether they're Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or Hikmatyar, they brought this to an arc. Uh, in fact, his, his lieutenant in this uh, relationship with Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and Hikmatyar is uh, uh, now the head of the Revolutionary Guards, uh, Qa'ani. Uh, but he does not have the same, the, the same uh, charisma that Qasem uh, Soleimani has based on, based on uh, what we are uh, hearing and reading. Uh, and also, he doesn't have the connections that Qasem Soleimani has in the level. So there is definitely... Uh, the, the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi Muhandis. Now, Abu Mahdi Muhandis is, is a force in his own right. The killing of these two people uh, as a response to the targeting of an American really threw um, uh, off the engine of, of Iran's uh, regional policy. It, it will take time to recover, uh, especially in the absence of U.S. dollars. So if you, if, if, if you have a regional militia, pro, a, a proxy militia network, and there's no money, you know, at the end of the day, headband wearing, uh, zealous uh, Shia militia uh, fighters uh, have uh, kids to feed. Uh, they've got hospital bills to pay. Uh, they can go for a month, two months, three months without being paid uh, and the US dollar. But, but once that starts to drag on 
And once ammunition starts to uh, dry up, uh, adding to that uh, the loss of somebody uh, that was considered, you know, the average fighter's idols, 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 uh, that's a huge blow to a regional proxy network that, that incurred uh, massive damage in the region. Uh, so I think I'll stop here and, and uh, let uh, Professor Tara ask some more uh, questions. But that essentially, I think, covers uh, the differences in, in, uh, in how, how the region is treated. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, for uh, a really excellent uh, set of opening remarks that I think put a lot of uh, important issues on the table that I'm hoping that we will dig into. You know, the premise of the talk is that there's a particular way in which um, Iran's neighbors view that country, and then there's a, a completely discordant way in which the United States views that country. That is, in your view, at odds with the facts. And you laid out a quite um, impressive litany of facts that need to be taken into account. What I find interesting, and I would love to get you to comment on, is the fact that this kind of uh, discordant view towards Iran exists within the United States, right? So as you alluded to, the Trump administration has a particular view of Iran that I think is congenial to your own view and to the view in the Gulf. But then uh, on the side of the Democratic Party, we have a, a very different view of Iran and a very different view of Iran's uh, neighbors. So for example, you mentioned Qasem Soleimani's um, killing. This was a killing that both Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren referred to as an assassination. I believe Elizabeth, Warren's refer or Elizabeth Warren referred to Qasem Soleimani as a a senior military official, right? As if he was like the postmaster general of Iran. I don't think he said uh, military even. It was almost as if he was a clerk in a, in a state library. I'm fairly certain she said senior foreign military official. Um, but, but, um, uh, so, so, um, but you also have on the on the side of the Democratic Party, of course, a very different view of Saudi Arabia. The nom presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party, Joe Biden, in November, I believe it was, said that he would, in a Democratic Party debate, said that he would make Saudi Arabia into a pariah. Uh, his quote. So, can you explain for me just how we got to this stage where? the view of Iran and the view of Iran's neighbors has become such a clearly partisan issue, because that does fe seem to me to be a novel development. That's an excellent question, I think. Uh, I think the two issues have to be uh, uh, separated uh, in order to uh, you know, embark on creating any sort of meaningful policy. You know. uh, but Saudi Arabia is bad, there's no reason, uh, there's no excuse uh, to use when assessing uh, the Iranian threat to, to the world or the region or, or anywhere else. We're not uh, here to, to uh, do moral comparisons of countries, but, but that is the tool that is used by people that are proponents of bringing Iran out of the cold, uh, quote unquote. Uh, the idea of why are we uh, enemies with Iran? We're, we're friends with Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia doesn't share our values on uh, X issue, Y issue, G issue, F issue. Uh, therefore, you know, we should reconsider our enmity with Iran. But that, again, fundamentally mischaracterizes the, the, the reason why there is an enmity with Iran. The reason why there's an enmity with Iran isn't because it's nastier than uh, X or Y other uh, uh, Middle Eastern country. It's because Iran has been uh, actively seeking, again, to upend what it perceives as a U.S.-led regional order and has the blood of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of U.S. servicemen on its hands and on a daily basis. Uh, reminds people that what it's trying to upend is this uh, Western order in the region. You know, there's no other country in the Middle East that wakes up in the morning and says, by the way, this is what I'm here to do, this is what I exist to achieve, uh, and the Iranian revolution will prevail, and these are the basic tenets of the Iranian revolution. Unfortunately, what we see in the United States is that uh, um, uh, there is this tendency uh, uh, to use uh, Saudi Arabia against Iran and to use Iran against Saudi Arabia in partisan debates about uh, these two countries. You know, it's perfectly normal, perfectly rational for one to have an opinion on the value system that exists in Saudi Arabia and its divergences from the value system that exists in the United States. You know, there are several, and uh, that's an endless discussion that one can have uh, online. Uh, but I don't think there's a place for that discussion when assessing the uh, Iranian threat for what it is 
geopolitically uh, and otherwise. And, and, and is there, uh, just to answer your question, is there, uh, uh, has Saudi Arabia become much more so a partisan uh, item than it was in the past? Of course, 100%. I mean, in the past, the, the, the support for Saudi Arabia has largely been bipartisan. But I think this, to a large degree, is, is uh, uh, a result of, of this, you know, strange time we're in uh, under President Trump. You know, one Emirati friend in Washington, D.C. once told me that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia is now like a piñata. Uh, everybody uh, in D.C. is wearing a blindfold and trying to swing at Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, they don't want uh, the pinata itself. They want to break the pinata and get the candy inside. And the candy inside is the Trump administration. So, so the idea is that you know there are uh, foundations that uh, uh, there, there are there are important uh, matters that, that act as a foundation for the U.S. Saudi relationship. You know this relationship uh, collapsed the Soviet Union. This relationship uh, uh, intervened and, and helped and. and uh, acted uh, in many ways uh, on the international level uh, and regionally to bring about uh, joint uh, political uh, and geopolitical interests uh, and goals. Uh, and it will continue uh, to be useful so long as it's useful. Uh, so, so, you know, it is a partisan issue today, but, you know, so many times we've seen that uh, uh, one issue or another becomes a very hot, uh, debated partisan issue and then next election cycle, it's not that uh, anymore. So, True, it's, it's something that is a partisan issue, but I don't think uh, it will remain to be such a hotly discussed and, and such a, such a uh, you know, uh, urgent po uh, policy issue so long as there is real uh, basis for the issue. How, how would you respond, Mohammed, to uh, those who might say, uh, who might argue that part of the reason that Saudi Arabia has come to be in such uh, poor odor in many uh, segments of the American foreign policy establishment is because of, uh, you know, the quality of decisions that have emerged from the Saudi leadership in the last couple of years and certain uh, fairly uh, dramatic missteps and um, such as the killing of Jamal Khashoggi or the uh, Yemeni adventure. How would you respond to people who point to those instances as the real drivers of this reconsideration of Saudi Arabia and Iran that's happening in some segments of the American foreign policy. First of all, I'd like to say that the killing of Jamal Khashoggi was a horrible, horrible crime that, that should be condemned every day, everywhere, always. I knew Jamal very well uh, for many, many years. Uh, and that definitely was, was a dark uh, spot uh, in Saudi Arabia and the region's history. Uh, of course. Um, again, there was outrage uh, as a result of the uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, killing and murder in, in, in the consulate in Istanbul. There continues to be outrage. And one, one of the reasons that we hear outrage about this uh, uh, murder, much more so than we hear outrage uh, about Iranian assassinations in Europe or Syrian assassinations in Europe, is that Saudi Arabia does not uh, conduct itself in this way. Uh, this type of, of foreign policy is a hallmark of, of Iranian regime foreign policy, whether it's assassinating uh, dissidents uh, across Europe. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't operate this way. It's never operated this way. So this is, does come as a shock to Saudi Arabians. It comes as a shock to everyone else. Again, uh, the, the trials are ongoing right now. There is a realization that this is, this is uh, a catastrophe that has to be dealt with in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so so that's that's on the Jamal issue. Uh, on on the other matters that you mentioned, um, you know, no country uh, in the world uh, doesn't make mistakes. The United States made endless mistakes in the region. Many would say that the, the, the invasion of Iraq was a, was a mistake. Uh, policy in Afghanistan, uh, in many ways, was a mistake. In many ways, did, uh, did well. Uh, but the point to consider here is that Saudi Arabia has long been uh, accused of being lazy by a policy circle in the United States. It's always, you know, the Saudis have to carry their own weight. They've got all of these shiny weapons. They've got all of these security concerns. Why don't they do? Uh, uh, their own uh, share of the work in the region. And once Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and this was not the case with Saudi Arabia in the past, Saudi policy was extremely risk averse. You know, they would, uh, it, it, it was very slow. It was almost lethargic at times. Uh, you know, in order to get uh, a coherent policy action by Saudi Arabia in the past, it would take a lot of deliberation. 
uh, to go through a very long process, uh, you know, that changed. And that changed sharply. And with any sharp change, there will be uh, missteps and there will be ways to optimize how things are done. Uh, the Yemen war, for example, was a step uh, uh, in that direction. And again, you know, uh, the Yemen war, I'm sure it could have been uh, uh, prosecuted in uh, a better way, but uh, all wars at the end of the day have, have you know, long lists of violations and, and ways that they could have been optimized. But, but one has to consider what the alternative to Saudi Arabia was uh, at that point in time, after the Houthi government took over Sana'a and, and drove out uh, the legitimate government backed by the United Nations in, in, in the deal overseen by Saudi Arabia, the power sharing deal and the Masana. The alternative would have been to give an Iranian-backed militia control over all of Yemen, to give uh, Bab al-Mandab to the Revolutionary Guards. You know, that's something at the end of the day, were it to happen, would never be accepted in any Western uh, uh, capital, would never be accepted in the United States. You know, Iranian control over both the state of Hormuz and Bab al-Mandab is just an idea that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for Egypt even. Uh, you know, that means they control uh, uh, effective, they, they effectively control uh, uh, the, the Suez Canal uh, whenever they like. So, so the idea of allowing Iran to set up a foothold in uh, uh, Yemen by controlling the central government in Sana'a was something that was, uh, uh, you know, unacceptable to many actors in the world. And that's why I think uh, uh, there was uh, wide-ranging support for Saudi Arabia's intervention in the form of UN Resolution 2216 and the U.S. and European support, as well as the Arab coalition that came uh, around Saudi Arabia uh, to protect them. You know, again, that, that's one of the differences in lenses uh, that I've been talking about. This is viewed as just an invasion of Yemen uh, in certain Western policy circles, whereas in the Arab world, it's viewed as uh, Iran uh, sticking its nose where it doesn't belong. Yemen is the, uh, uh, you know, the stronghold of Arabs, it's where the Arabs uh, first came from. Uh, everybody has seen what Iran has done in Iraq, what Iran has done in, yeah, in Lebanon, and the idea that they would come to the poorest Arab nation, set up a foothold there, uh, and do what they do in the, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, in the Bab al-Mandir, uh, was something that, uh, you know, uh, in many ways repulsed people, regardless of what their political backgrounds were uh, in the region. And, and that's, I think, uh, the missing uh, uh, part of the equation when it comes to assessing why Saudi Arabia went into Yemen and why it's in uh, wonderful. I, I do want to open this uh, for discussion, but first I want to come to uh, my co-host, uh, Professor Matt Bund, who has a question. I wanted to press you on a couple of points. One, you said that uh, maximum pressure had had tangible results throughout the region. And similarly, you said that uh, Soleimani's deputy would never be able to, or at least it would take a while to recover uh, the loss of Soleimani. And I wondered, you know, he's been Soleimani's deputy for a long, long time. It, I would have to guess that he had a lot of uh, the connections that Soleimani had, if not the charisma. Um, they must have been planning for this possibility that, you know, Suleimani did a lot of dangerous things and he was a smart guy. He must have thought about, okay, what happens if I die? Um, so I wondered if you could talk about what, what we've actually seen in terms of changes of militia behavior or IRGC behavior since Suleimani's death. Sure. Uh, that, these are both excellent questions. I'll start with the, with the Ghani and, and Suleimani question. I think uh, uh, the Iranians didn't know what was coming when uh, Hassan Soleimani was uh, eliminated in, in Baghdad. I think he, he, he wasn't taking uh, precautions too much uh, by flying uh, from Lebanon uh, to Iraq. Um, and I'd like to, to, to um, uh, you know, bring the example of the first time that the United States and the Israeli intelligence had Hassan Soleimani in their crosshairs. And that was in 2008 under uh, the Obama administration. Twice before uh, the United States had the uh, Hazrat Suleiman in the process. And that, I'll, I'll speak about the second. The first time actually was in a convoy where he was headed towards Erbil, and then for one reason or another, the Pentagon said, don't pull the trigger, don't take out Hazrat Suleiman. The second time was in 2008 in Damascus. Uh, and the target at that point in time was Ismail, uh, um, um, uh, no. Not Mustafa Badr al he was killed in 2008. I can't believe I forgot. The senior Hezbollah uh, 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 operative. Um, uh, that operative uh, 
uh, was uh, actually very, very uh, careful in his movements. Uh, and, and the way he was caught, it was a joint uh, operation. Emad Monia, thank you from Francis Karam. I can't believe I forgot the name. I have written papers, uh, but thank you. Uh, so Ahmad Mournia uh, was very careful uh, in his movements. And the way he was caught is that he was uh, visiting his mistress in Damascus. And Mossad had been tracking that for a while. Uh, and at one point in time, a satellite image, or a drone image, I think it was, in real time, uh, uh, was capturing uh, Ahmad Mournia leaning on his car with Qasem Soleimani next to him. And then as if people would know in the room, I, I, I imagine the, the bomb that killed Ahmad Mournia was placed inside uh, the headrest of his car while he was visiting his mistress. That attack was called off uh, by the United States and uh, the Israelis were told to stand uh, down. And the rationale for both uh, times that uh, Soleimani was in the crosshairs of the United States slash and or Israel was that, uh, you know, uh, this is a can of worms and we don't want to go there. This man can, uh, uh, you know, truly damage uh, U.S. interests and U.S. servicemen in the region. Uh, so, so um, there was this sort of unwritten rule where uh, Qasem Soleimani wouldn't be targeted. Again, throughout that period, didn't mean that he stopped targeting Americans. He continued to target Americans. He was still a threat to Americans. Uh, it's worth having a discussion as to why uh, eliminating him was off the table at that point in time. But now, if you look at the lingo that was used by the Trump administration, uh, they very clearly say you know, that. Uh, uh, he was across the, the river or the marsh from the U U.S. Uh, embassy compound, and he was planning attacks on the U.S. embassy and on U.S. servicemen, and that's why uh, the decision was made to, to uh, eliminate Dr. Soleimani. That's on the Soleimani thing. And, and his deputy, uh, sorry. Uh, the deputy, you know, sure, he's not charismatic, but again, his, his uh, focus, and, and again, this is just my speculation. I could be wrong. Time will tell exactly how... Uh, and if he will fill the shoes of Qasem Soleimani. His um, uh, uh, expertise lies in uh, the Afghanistan region. Uh, he, he knows the Al-Qaeda operatives very well. He was the person who dealt to, to a large degree with uh, uh, Hamza bin Laden and, and uh, Zarqawi and all of these other uh, Al-Qaeda officials uh, uh, that uh, were harbored at one time or another in Iran. Uh, he's the one who dealt with Hikmat Yar. Uh, uh, he was the one who dealt with uh, the Taliban. You know, uh, at that point in time, it was the U.S. presence in Afghanistan that drove uh, this uh, uh, odd alliance between Sunni jihadists and the Iranian regime. And the point was to deplete uh, resources and, and efforts of the United States and target uh, uh, Americans in Afghanistan. So that is his area of expertise. In fact, you know, after all of this time, he was he was uh, 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 pitched to the Iraqis as, a, as an ambassador to, to Baghdad, to, to, to the Afghanis, sorry, as a, a, an ambassador to Kabul and the uh, and, uh, Ghani said, no, we don't want uh, uh, any to, to come anywhere close to Afghanistan. So it's a different set of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, traits that have. And, and this is not to say that uh, Ghani is not uh, capable or that he is not professional or he's not, you know, a product of uh, the rigor of the Quds Force. That's not to say that. It's just to say that uh, uh, Qasim Soleimani truly was an extraordinary figure in his charisma. And, and I met several people that actually sat down with him. You know, the way even, even, even opponents of his would speak uh, about him. He had uh, a certain charisma. He, he made people feel like they were special, like he gave them their undivided attention. Add to that uh, the zeal that he showed uh, and the prowess that he had. You know, having that uh, uh, mixture in one person, having the, all of these traits in one person, is something you only uh, come across uh, you know, once maybe in a hundred years. And that was a huge asset uh, uh, for the Revolutionary Guards. And I... You know, again, I can't stress enough how this idea that uh, this is not important, it can be replaced tomorrow. No, it can't be replaced. Replacing Qasem Soleimani is going to be very difficult. Uh, and uh, not just because of his wide network and his wide network of friendships, uh, but because of the quality of the relationships that he has, not, not just the, the number of Okay, I would like us to uh, get to some more questions. I'm sorry, uh, Tarek, there was just yes. one more question, and it was about maximum pressure, how, yes. how it manifested. So, so sure, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, has been making gains in Syria, but Iranian leverage has been waning to a large degree after the maximum pressure campaign. What we're seeing is that the Russians have been, uh, uh, you know, stepping up much more than before on issues that concern the ground in Syria before they control the air, but now they, they are very much... Uh, uh, involved in ground operations in Syria with the uh, uh, regime, and that, and 
the involvement of Turkey also falls into this. But you know, the, the influence that uh, uh, Iran used to wield in Syria as a result of its resources and its militias has waned to a large extent. But that, I wouldn't say, is the most important. Not Neither that nor its influence on Hezbollah. I wouldn't say either of those are the most important manifestation of a regressing Iranian power in the region. I would say the Iraqi protests are, where you have, uh, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of young Iraqis in the streets chanting uh, against Qasem Soleimani or against uh, other Shia leaders or against Khamenei. That's something that would have been unheard of in the past. Uh, and that's testament to, to how demographics in the region have fundamentally changed. You know, the old formula that Iran used uh, or, you know, resistance, anti-imperialism, using, uh, uh, you know, Shia propaganda and ideology to target Arab Shia populations uh, uh, and uh, indoctrinate and, and uh, uh, you know, create organizations and militias around it. That, that's something young people uh, are not buying in the region. It's not just in Iraq, it's elsewhere in the region. You know, young people want jobs. They see that their parents uh, afforded houses uh, and, and uh, put them through school and they don't have any prospect of finding a job, let alone owning their own house in the future. In the past, uh, you know, uh, uh, this type of, of, of ideology, revolutionary ideology, was used alongside economic uh, uh, assistance to, to win over uh, uh, masses in countries uh, like Iraq and elsewhere. Today, there's no economic aspect here, and, and people aren't buying this sort of ideological mobilization uh, uh, in any case, let alone as a substitute for meaningful economic reform or meaningful so what we're seeing now uh, in Iraq, this utter rejection of, of Iranian uh, uh, influence and of Iranian-backed candidates as prime minister. I mean, uh, these are things that didn't make it to the U.S. media, unfortunately, very unfortunately. But the protest movement in Iraq was one of the most inspirational uh, movements. And listening to what these people were saying in the street was, was uh, actually fascinating. It was an, uh, a rejection, a total rejection within the Shia areas of Iraq of anything that had to do in Iran. And one of the reasons for that is that Iran truly drove, uh, drove uh, the Iraqi economy in the dirt by using it as, as a, a sanction circumvention tool uh, and by inso installing essentially uh, uh, warlords answerable to the uh, revolutionary guards as uh, uh, the entity that exercises the monopoly of the use of force in the country. It's not state security, it's the hash that exercises uh, the brute force in the country. So I see uh, the first hand that I have up is by uh, Shahab Asuda. So I'm going to unmute uh, you and allow you to ask your question of uh, Mr. Mohammed al -Yahya. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, great talk. I really enjoy that. I have two questions. I, I, it's uh, both of very, very short. Uh, so first of all, uh, so how much do you think that the, you know, the Iran recent behavior in the region is somehow the response to uh, the Saudi uh, kingdom hostility toward Iranian people and uh, Iranian government. Sorry, uh, just could you repeat the last part? So the, the Saudi's hostility toward Iranian people and Iranian government, especially in the, the financial support of separatists and uh, um, terrorist organization uh, like Jundullah uh, al-Ahwaz in the southern part of Iran. Uh, so that's actually my first question. The second question is you mentioned that, you know, a Saudi doesn't want war in the region. But John Kerry in a Munich Security Conference in 2018, he mentioned that, you know, uh, the uh, Saudi king and uh, I think Egyptian president asked U.S. several times to bomb Iran. So who should we believe, you or John Kerry? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, in terms of the first question, uh, I think uh, uh, what Iran is doing in the region is primarily a response to the United States uh, and to the maximum pressure campaign that exists for the United States. You know, there have been uh, periods of time where there was a detente or rapprochement between the Iranians and the Saudis, primarily during the Khatami and Rafsanjani eras. Uh, but uh, the current escalation uh, in the region, I think, is, is directly a response to uh, the U.S. Uh, and, and, you know, withdrawing from the JCPOA and enacting the maximum pressure on Iran. It's not the Saudis that are uh, pressuring Iran economically, but the Americans uh, that are pressuring Iran economically. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, sorry, the second part of the question was uh, uh, John Kerry. I mean, yeah, John Kerry mentioning that uh, uh, the Saudis asked to bomb Iran. You know, I don't uh, think uh, uh, that's true. Um, I don't know what John Kerry was basing uh, what he said on, but uh, you know, I don't think we have to look any further than. Uh, 
the Saudi responses to Iran's uh, uh, attacks on the Saudi world facilities. Those were an act of war, uh, 100%. You know, uh, I would say that uh, every Houthi attack on uh, uh, Saudi Arabia with the Iranian ballistic missiles was also an act of war. Uh, uh, if uh, Saudi Arabia did want war with Iran, it had many opportunities to spark a war with Iran, to create uh, a regional conventional military conflict uh, uh, backed by the United States. But time and again, we've seen that Saudi Arabia and other regional actors that would be uh, uh, you know, uh, within uh, the, the most sensitive conflict zones have chosen uh, uh, not to go to war. Uh, but again, you know, we shouldn't conflate that uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, a commitment uh, to any measures that limit Iran's capabilities to conduct its foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have here is from uh, Yusuf Azizi. I will unmute him. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Yusuf Aizi. I'm a PhD candidate from Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, it's not a surprise that I disagree with 90% uh, of what you talk, but let's uh, have some productive and hopeful uh, talk here. So uh, I have a question about the future. And uh, it seems that the, from the perspective of grand strategy of United States, not a difference between Republican and the Democrat, the priority of uh, Middle East for United States grand strategy is lower is becoming lower and lower uh, in comparison to, for example, East Asia, Southeast Asia, or Eastern Europe. So I, I was wondering if the recent activities by Saudis, as you said previously, somebody says that it is lazy. I don't agree with that. But uh, these current activities, harsh activities by Saudis in the region, Yemen, Bahrain, or elsewhere. So because that they fear that United States may be sooner or later leave the region or uh, reduce the footprint in the Middle East or West, West of Asia. And, and the second point here is that several times Iranian officials offer, has, offering, uh, has been offering the, uh, you know, the regional security talk with Saudis, with all countries in the region and always rejected by Saudi. So uh, do you see any hope in this regard that these countries uh, sit together and talk about the regional security. It all has uh, regional, I, I know, uh, has concerns, but needs to negotiate to each other. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, no, I don't think that's very likely. You know, I think and, and, and part of the answer to your question was inside the question. Um, is the, uh, Saudi Arabia worried about the United States leaving the region? Is uh, uh, Saudi Arabia willing to uh, act without the United States uh, and sit down and find the regional security framework? The reality of the matter is that the perception of the Iranian state of, of Iran by most Arab states is that it is a belligerent expansionist uh, uh, actor. That's what you'll hear when you talk to people in this region. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Jawad Darif's idea about uh, hope or whatever it was called about creating this uh, uh, maritime security framework and the larger regional security framework is frankly laughed at uh, in Saudi Arabia or everywhere else in the world. Because, you know, if you look at uh, the top uh, 10, top 15 national security uh, uh, issues that they have across the region, all of them, uh, to one extent or another, would tie back uh, 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 to Iran. You could disagree with their assessments, maybe you say they overemphasize on Iran or not, but, you know, it is the Iranian presence that they consider a problem in Iraq, the same in Syria, the same in uh, Lebanon, the same in Bahrain, the same in Yemen. Uh, so, so it's uh, not uh, as much fear of Iran, uh, of the United States vacating the region uh, that I think pushes countries like Saudi Arabia to intervene in places in Yemen, rather than avoiding the fate of, uh, that has befallen Iraq or Syria or Lebanon. You know, Yemen is already a, a problematic state and it has a border with Saudi Arabia. So, so avoiding, uh, uh, you know, situation of state failure and Iranian control like Baghdad is something that, uh, you know, is a sentiment shared by all of Arabs. Again, you know, uh, the perception in, uh, among many people in the Gulf uh, and the Arab world is that, uh, you know, the misfortune, uh, poverty and state failure uh, uh, that we see uh, in places like Iraq, Lebanon and, and uh, Syria is a direct result of Iranian imperialism and expansionism. So, so um, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, pretty much the idea. And again, you know, the Iranian, Mr. Jawad Darif's ideas about creating a security framework, you know, one uh, official here in the Gulf you know, laughingly said, uh, the only people that should be on that table are the revolutionary guards that never even pick up his phone. Anyways, and that this is, this is a joke that, uh, it's something that's laughed at. Uh, 
if there is uh, decision making, it comes from Khamenei and from his revolutionary guards. Uh, and it seems that these uh, actors are hellbent on uh, you know, actualizing revolutionary ideals across the region. Uh, uh, and they've, they've gotten very, very, very good at it. And they've already invested in this uh, uh, framework in the region. So again, the idea of sharing the region, the idea of uh, cutting it up, Saudi Arabia doesn't have uh, uh, expansionist uh, uh, aspirations in the region. It doesn't have proxy building tools. It has, it has a conventional army that it will push back against when it sees conventional uh, uh, threats. Yemen is a case in point. Uh, but the idea of uh, sharing the region assumes that there are two imperialistic poles or two expansionist poles. That's not something that's part of Saudi policy and decision making. Uh, and the idea of, of uh, removing uh, the United States is not something that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is eagerly looking after or, uh, or even thinks that's beneficial. It's, uh, it's bringing stability in the region and containing the influence of the revolutionary guards that they think is the priority both for Saudi Arabia and the current uh, US administration and for a large uh, part of Arab populations and governments. Okay, the next question I have is by Cameron uh, Hansarinia. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Aliaya, for your time. You mentioned that in your talk, uh, I should say, actually, I, I'm a, a graduate of the college in the class of uh, 2018 uh, and the policy director uh, now at the National Union for Democracy in Iran. Uh, you mentioned the, the really inspiring protests uh, in, 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 in Iraq, uh, in, in Basra, in Baghdad, uh, in Karbala, of all places, uh, against uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, against uh, the influence of the Islamic Republic. Uh, but we've seen those protests uh, at even larger scales and, and equally inspirational in Iran itself against the Islamic Republic. And these protests are not merely economic, but ones that call for an end to the regime in its entirety and for the establishment of a secular democracy. But today's conversation has been based on uh, uh, engagement between uh, of, of many forms between the Arab world, the United States, and the Islamic Republic as a government. What will it take uh, for the Arab world or the United States to catch up to where the Iranian people are, which is they're asking for a dialogue with them, with their secular democratic opposition, and bypassing the Islamic Republic, which has you know a forty-year track record of not only oppressing the world but oppressing them first and foremost. So, what will it take to get uh, the Arab world and the U.S. on the track of the Iranian people and following their lead and saying, "Deal with us, not our regime." Thank you. I mean, I think that's a good question. Uh, the part about the United States, I think, is more um, uh, uh, relevant and, and uh, uh, more pertinent than, than the part about the regional actors. I don't think that countries in the region are going to create any uh, uh, campaigns where they target the Iranian population. They're not going to interfere uh, directly in, in what's going on inside Iran. Uh, too many actors in the region, I, I, I uh, would expect that presents too large of a set of risks. Um, the idea is to contain uh, the current Iranian regime and the way it is using uh, Iran's resources in the region. Um, the United States, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think uh, we've seen much more uh, messaging directed uh, uh, directly at, at the Iranian people by the State Department today, whether it's by Brian Hope or uh, uh, by the Secretary of State. Um, Again, yeah, I see. I see that uh, uh, there's um, uh, engagement with the protest movement by the current U.S. administration much more than we saw in 2009 uh, from the Obama administration. Uh, but yeah, than that, uh, I don't have much to say. Okay, uh, our next uh, questioner is uh, Salim. Go ahead. I would like to start by just saying uh, thank you all for putting this together. I think the perspectives that were shared here were yeah, things that really need to be discussed. Um, I'm going to keep my question really short. Um, and this is sort of a follow up question to Professor Matt Burns question. So basically, with maximum pressure, yes, we did see tangible results. But I think that we're also seeing severe side effects. So in context of the title of your talk, what do you foresee as the worst case scenario? That's that's a good uh, question. First of all, let's put things back into, into perspective. I think. I think the worst case scenario 
could be what we experienced uh, towards the end of uh, the last administration's tenure in, in, in the White House. You know, Iran was was given uh, you know almost a billion and a half uh, dollars in, in, in euros and dollars uh, in cash, uh, and uh, and uh, we've seen that sanctions were incrementally lifted uh, on Iran, and that there was. Uh, to a large degree, a normalization of its regional uh, uh, posture. Uh, today, we see a reversal of that. Uh, today, we see uh, an Iran that is pressured. So, even if a deal comes uh, out now, and I think, you know, a worse scenario would be that uh, we see something like the JCPOA plus one, where uh, we've got uh, a nuclear deal, maybe with uh, uh, some amendments on sunset clauses or. Uh, an improvement here or there, and then you know, it's, it's declared a victory, uh, and everything goes back to normal, uh, and Iran doubles down on its activities in the region. I think that would be uh, an unfavorable outcome, uh, to say the least. Um, but uh, that's one. The worst uh, uh, outcome to that, I think, is conventional war, where uh, you know, uh, Iran's military, as, as weak, dated, and dysfunctional as it is, is pitted against uh, more well-equipped militaries that are backed by stronger powers. Inevitably, Iran would be at a disadvantage, Iran would lose. But at the end of the day, of course, uh, there is no winner in, uh, in any war. There is just a series of losers, some of which lose more than others. Inevitably, Iran would lose more than anybody else. But again, everybody would lose at the end of that. And I think that's, that's a pretty bad scenario. And, and Mohammed, your your sense of the best case scenario, or you know, if everything unfolds as you think it should unfold what what happens are you looking for a regime change in iran like i tell me the story by which iran uh, transforms into the kind of neighbor that saudi arabia and its other neighbors would be uh happy to have one one former former white house official white house official is a good friend of mine i won't name him he says uh, and this is a joke that he starts many of his talks with he says you know it's the job of the united states to teach iran geography uh, and, and it's a funny joke, but I think uh, it's a very important uh, concept. You know, the ideal scenario is for Iran to cut its losses in Iraq and elsewhere, uh, to confine itself to its borders, just like uh, militarily and, and, and otherwise, just like everybody else in the region does, and work towards normalizing, opening up uh, to the world. Iran is a fantastic country with a great and rich history. Iran has ski slopes. It has, uh, uh, you know, the Caspian Sea. It has... Uh, uh, beaches. It's got a highly educated population. It's got uh, uh, beautiful landscapes, very rich history. There is no reason for Iran not to be, uh, uh, you know, an economic powerhouse. It just chooses uh, a path that is contrary to that. So the ideal scenario, I think, is the same ideal scenario for uh, anywhere uh, in the world, for, for, for Europe, for the United States, for the region, and it's to see that Iran, to see an Iran that does not pose a daily national security threat to anybody, but one that is focused inwards and, and but that is, you know, being ideal, idealistic, that's probably uh, not going to manifest, which takes us to the other point. And this is the point that I, I should have made in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, and it is that, you know, sanctions can be an end in and of themselves. Uh, detractors of Trump's strategy always point that the maximum pressure campaign did not bring Iran to the table. First of all, maximum pressure campaigns or campaigns to pressure, uh, they take time. You know, in order to enact real uh, pressure or real economic blows on Iran, that'll take a year, two years, perhaps three years, that, that comes with time. But uh, often that argument overlooks the fact that depriving a regime like Iran of the resources that it needs to keep up its problematic uh, and deadly behavior in the region uh, could be an end in and of itself. One can say, okay, these people are bad actors of the revolutionary guards, they've got access to US dollars, we are left with many hundreds of thousands of dead Syrians and ethnic cleansing and genocide in that country, dysfunction in Iraq, all of that was a result of that regime having the resources to conduct its foreign policy. Limiting uh, those resources is a good way, good uh, way uh, to deal with that dynamic at the minimum. So, so that's enough. So the idea is that if enough pressure and pain is applied to Iran, they can, they will, in your view, uh, adjust or correct their behavior. It's a long shot, in my opinion. But uh, the idea that depri depriving them of the resources or sanctioning them can be an, in, an end in and of itself is something that I think we should be more comfortable with intellectually. If they are using these resources on cultivating proxies in the region that are responsible for genocide, ethnic cleansing, etc., 
rather than on their own people's economic uh, uh, prosperity, then a long-term sanctions uh, regime against uh, uh, Khamenei's uh, uh, political system uh, is probably the right thing to do for the region and for Iran. Okay, our next question is from uh, Dr. Uh, Ariel Petrovich. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for, for this presentation. This was uh, a very useful way to sort of get um, multiple perspectives. Uh, I wanted to return focus just a little bit to the, the nuclear issue as well, um, which uh, obviously, you know, there's a, a number of issues that we have been dealing um, with Iran on for, for many years. Uh, the, you know, regional actions have been going on for decades. So has the nuclear program. Um, but I'm wondering how, if we were to shift focus towards uh, regional activities, um, how how would basically ignoring the nuclear program um, and sort of allowing uh, proliferation to continue unmonitored or, or uncontrolled, do you think that that would basically, Iran being able to break out, test, and maybe develop a, a nuclear weapon, um, would that affect its ability to act in the region in a different way? So basically, in the region, you know, we've had simmering problems for many, many years, um, and they haven't really been going away for a long time. Um, but the nuclear problem seems like one that could be an imminent game changer. Uh, so do you think that Iran, if it were able to develop a, and test a nuclear weapon, would that change its ability to act in the region um, beyond what we've seen so far? Um, I'm not gonna discuss the merits of a nuclear deal as a nuclear accord, uh, because I don't think that's a topic of discussion here, but it's important to consider that the nuclear deal does not ensure that Iran is a nuclear weapon-free country forever. There's an expiration date to it. There has to be a new deal that is uh, uh, negotiated at some point in the future uh, in order to ensure that, that uh, Iran complies and, and continues to comply. So, so there are many detractors uh, to the deal uh, itself, saying that it wasn't the best deal uh, that uh, was signed between Iran and the United States. And again, you know, I remember the time it was signed uh, there was uh, a sort of fear mongering in that uh, uh, members of the Obama administration, people close to them, who were saying that if there is no deal signed in July, then there will be a war in August. That's not true. If the deal wasn't signed in July, there could have been more negotiations. I think there was a little bit too much, too, uh, they were a little bit too eager to sign a deal uh, and not uh, a deeper the deal. Uh, again, if the uh, nuclear deal stays as, as it was, we would see by the time that. Uh, expired by the time that Iran was in a place that it could uh, uh, develop a nuclear weapon, we could see a region that is totally uh, uh, you know, crippled by uh, the Revolutionary Guards. We could see uh, an Iraq-like situation uh, in other countries, Yemen, uh, maybe other regions, maybe regions in, in Africa. Um, so the idea that, uh, you know, again, ignoring uh, Iran's regional uh, actions uh, uh, has called, was cause for concern during uh, President Obama's tenure. Uh, and to answer your question about uh, the militias always being there, it's true. Iran has cultivated militias uh, more or less since it was uh, founded. But we have seen uh, an extreme uptick in 2011. And, and 2011 is when uh, the nuclear deal negotiations actually began. Uh, uh, we saw doubling down uh, uh, of Iranian influence in Syria that claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. We've seen doubling down of Iran's uh, uh, influence in Iraq, much more so than pre-2011, Hashd al-Shaabi, uh, etc. And we've seen, uh, you know, more direct control of the political process in Lebanon. Uh, so all of these things, uh, you know, uh, have uh, costs uh, to them. Uh, costs in terms of the future prosperity of these countries, costs in terms of human lives. Hundreds of thousands of people have uh, died. Uh, millions have suffered economically uh, uh, as a result of, of uh, these uh, Iranian actions, and again, you know, I I, uh, I value your questions because because I think it really does wrap up what, what the crux of this presentation is. That is what people in the region focus on much more so than the nuclear issue. So it really shows the, the two two uh, different languages. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Katrina Lego. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the talk. I'm from George Washington University, and um, I had a question going back to what you mentioned about uh, Trump posting a lot of his foreign policy on Twitter. 
And April 22nd, uh, President Trump had posted uh, direction for the U.S. Navy to destroy Iranian boats that harassed its ships. So my question for you was, um, how do you see the changes on the operational level for the IRA and or IRGC um, in response to this, or has it changed or will it change uh, due to the COVID concerns? And what will that maritime picture look like uh, in the near term? That's a great. That's a great question. I think, and I think um, uh, that the Iranian um, uh, little um, uh, provocation that happened recently, where they um, uh, uh, harassed U.S. ships, is its latest uh, iteration of its incremental and systematic uh, escalation campaign after the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Uh, do I see a difference uh, in, in uh, Iranian harassment during the Trump administration? One hundred percent. There's it's night and day. During uh, Obama's tenure, we saw that this type of harassment would happen you know, once every couple of months at least. Uh, and uh, more importantly, we saw that uh, the Revolutionary Guards uh, you know, seized a U.S. Uh, ship full of Marines near Farsi Island uh, and uh, uh, you know, made them uh, go on their knees before uh, handcuffing them, took those pictures, and then released on, on public television, state television, that the U.S. Marines cried and that the kindness of the Revolutionary Guards who detained them in Farsi Island is what caused them to, to relax. Those uh, ships were not in Iranian waters. That was at the height of the friendliness, so to speak, between Iran and the United States. You know, any rational actor would expect the Iranians to send uh, a bunch of sandwiches and an engineer if a U.S. ship broke down and not arrest. Uh, Americans. But I think the reason that the, uh, the Iranians acted that way at that time is because uh, they were very certain that there would be no response by uh, the United States because of the firmness uh, of uh, the Obama administration's policy in favor of Iran and in favor of uh, Rafael So there wasn't much that the Iranians could do in the way of uh, harassing or provoking the United States that would elicit any harmful response to Iran. So I think the calculus was, let's flex our muscles, let's saber rattle, for domestic consumption and humiliate Americans because we know that there's not going to be a response. Uh, what happened with the killing of Qasem Soleimani is that the United States had uh, a form of escalation weapons. They didn't respond uh, uh, to any of the incremental small escalations uh, on the Iranian side, the downing of missiles, downing of uh, drones, attacks on pipelines, attack on Aramco, etc. Uh, but then they were uh, uh, met with a very disproportionate uh, and debilitating blow in the, in the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi Mohandes. Uh, now what they're seeing is that you know, they're trying to test the waters once more, uh, and the response by Trump on Twitter is, I will sink these, these ships. Uh, he said that he would respond for after uh, if, if an American was targeted, he did. Uh, and now it remains to be seen whether they will send uh, ships to, to harass U.S. Uh, uh, crafts again. But it's important to consider that this is the only example of the harassment of U.S. Uh, uh, military uh, ships uh, since the maximum pressure campaign started. And I think you know, deterrence is a function of clarity. If, if it's clear that there will be a response by the Americans that's demonstrated, then that, that gives the United States deterrence. Uh, during uh, the last administration's tenure, uh, it really didn't matter that the United States had 12 aircraft carriers and the rest of the world had 11 aircraft carriers combined because there was uh, you know, an unwavering belief in Iran that that military force would not be used uh, against the Islamic Republic, and it was taken advantage of. So in, in, in a way, you know, this sort of Twitter diplomacy and, and uh, you know, wild card uh, approach to dealing with Iran does uh, have an effect on the decision-making process uh, of the Revolutionary Guards and of the Americans, especially since you know, uh, the last response by the United States, the elimination of Qasem Soleimani, really dealt a huge blow operationally to the, to the Islamic Republic. Uh, the question of what the Americans will do next if uh, there is a transgression is something that I think is being discussed in Tehran until today. The next question I have is from uh, Dr. Khalid Saeed of the Middle East Initiatives. Hi, um, I have a question about the Saudi perspective um, about what happened when Iran attacked the oil facilities. Now you're saying that you know uh, the smart response was not to do anything, um, and I guess from a Saudi government's perspective, what is the red line considered by the Saudi government that if attacked, 
or if Iran attacked certain, um, you know, other areas or cities, then that would be a red line, and that would, you know, prompt a military response by Saudi Arabia, because uh, because there is a uh, large consensus in the region that actually what happened was just a simple sign of weakness by Saudi Arabia, because Iran would not dare to attack other countries in the region in the way that they did Saudi Arabia. Like for instance, they would they would not attack. Egypt, because they know that they would get a very powerful response. So what does Saudi Arabia consider a red line? Um, I think that's a good question. First of all, I don't purport to speak for the Saudi government in any way. Um, I can only speculate as to what they're uh, thinking about. But um, there, there's several parts to this question. First, uh, there is an understanding, I think, in the region that maximum pressure hurts. It works uh, and it hurts and it will cause lashing out on the part of the Iranian regime. The ideal scenario for the Iranian regime is to raise the threat level of, uh, or the risk level of conventional war. Conventional war scares everybody, and if everybody's scared enough, then people will start to U-turn on the maximum pressure, give concessions to Iran, uh, uh, and give them the lifeline that they need to, to uh, support their uh, regional network. It's a trap. That's how it's viewed, uh, I think, by many people uh, in Washington and in the region that these are all uh, traps, these, this Iranian incremental escalation. So if there is any possibility to outright ignore them, and keep the maximum pressure mounting, that is the most apt and uh, uh, effective way to deal with uh, these traps. Uh, the second uh, part of your question is, uh, you know, there is uh, uh, an element of, uh, international, of, of putting the onus on the international community to act when the global energy supply is, is, is attacked. You know, when uh, a place like Rasta Nura is uh, uh, attacked, uh, it's not just Saudi sovereignty that is infringed upon, it's not just Saudi Arabia that is attacked, but it is the, the supply, the global energy supply that allows us all to use our cars, that allows us all to, to live uh, in a 21st century world that is uh, under attack. And, and, and that's something that should be protected by the international community. And the same applies, by the way, to Yemen. Uh, securing the Bab al Mandeb Straits and ensuring the free flow. Of, of energy as well as uh, goods through that state and up to Suez and through the Mediterranean, wherever it's going to go. You know, that is something that is the international community's responsibility. That is something that uh, uh, is protected in cooperation with and in deliberation with the international community. And that is exactly what we saw after the attacks on Iran. Uh, a unilateral uh, uh, response to that uh, would have been difficult for those two reasons. One, the attack was much more than an attack just on Saudi Arabia, and two, uh, this was something that was totally expected uh, as a result of the maximum pressure campaign, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, testament to the fact that it is effective. The fact that the Iranian regime is taking risks uh, that are this uh, uh, big. But I mean, if I just may add one more comment about the maximum pressure cam campaign, I, I think one thing that the last three decades have taught us about Iran's, you know, I guess uh, experience in the Middle East is that the maximum pressure campaign did not work. Their influence has gotten bigger. Uh, their reach is is far, you know, greater in the region. So maximum pressure campaign is not working as far as what it is supposed to accomplish. Uh, and it's and it's I, only I, being used and it's only being used as a as a cry with you know with the Iranian people because the Iranian government can use the Iranian government can use these, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, points of, well, you know, the maximum pressure campaign, you know, this is, this is done by the US and the Western allies in cooperation with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf yeah. to try to punish the Iranian people when it's not. So the, the, the maximum pressure campaign has not worked. So I, I, at, at some I, I, point, I, yeah. I disagree. I, I think I disagree, and I, I, I would, uh, you know, invite you to look at uh, what we saw in Iraq. The, the right. uh, uh, lack of popularity that we've been seeing in Iraq for the Iranian regime, the hatred that we've been seeing by young Iraqis for the Iranian-controlled uh, political system in that country, in the ongoing protests that have gone on in Iraq, is alarming. You know, that's something that took everybody in the policy world by storm. Uh, seeing, seeing young Shias. 
uh, rejecting their own uh, uh, political leadership, rejecting uh, uh, Iran, chanting against uh, uh, religious figures that once enjoyed uh, uh, sanctity and, and, and would never be uh, spoken out against the public is, is testament to that. And also, you know, the amount of protests that we've been seeing in Iran since uh, the New Year's of 2017 protests, more very recently in Qom and Mashhad in areas that were considered the backbone of the regime. We've seen people coming out in droves in the street, not against the sanctions regime of the United States, but against Khamenei himself for the first time in the history of the Islamic Republic. And this was happening concurrently among, in, in dozens of cities all over Iran. We see photos, uh, videos of young students in Iran that refuse to walk on top of uh, uh, American flags that are laid out there by the regime for them to step on on a daily basis. Those are the same students that end up in jail for protesting against uh, 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 the regime. So the signs of, of uh, the, the maximum pressure campaign, uh, I think, are very abundant. Uh, and I think it is working. Uh, based on, on the change in public sentiment uh, in Arab countries and in Iran against the regime, but also uh, the operational obstacles that are put in front of the IRGC now. That's finding difficult. Uh, uh, that's finding it very difficult to pay uh, uh, its militiamen in Iraq and elsewhere uh, amid the shortage of U.S. dollars as in that country. You know, and, and again, the third thing that shows this is the desperation that the Iranian regime has to get these sanctions reversed. It is willing to risk conventional war. It is willing to go to lengths that it's never going to be for, to kill U.S. servicemen, to attack, uh, attack uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. These all reek of desperation. Nobody acts like that unless the maximum pressure campaign that's mounted on them is extremely effective. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what demonstrates its effectiveness. This is a lo longer conversation. We only have time for, for one uh, more question. But I will say, uh, Mohammed, I guess it's sort of uh, ch uh, challenging to say that Iran's quote unquote bad behavior is evidence that maximum pressure is working when Iran's bad behavior is why you are pursuing a maximum pressure policy. And so I would be interested in knowing how one falsifies this uh, idea that uh, maximum pressure is or is not no, working. But there, there's a difference between the escalation against US interests directly, like attack on ships, attack on drones. That's one thing. But uh, the cultivation of the long-term regional proxy where it works is another thing. It is the threat to that regional system that it has in place. Over 100 Shia militia, you know, probably one of the curses to Iran is the sheer size of its proxy network. It got too big uh, to maintain. So, so when that regional proxy network, that long-term installation in the region that ensures uh, 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 you know, the protection of Iranian expansionism, when that's under threat, it resorts to... to upping the ante and it resorts to uh, attaching a cost to the maximum pressure campaign in the hopes that there is a reversal that allows uh, for uh, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, breathing room uh, that will in turn allow for, for uh, uh, the, the, the cultivation. Of the so there are two different uh, uh, concepts. I see. Fair enough. Let me come to our last question by Dr. Masa Ruhi, who is one of our collaborators in this uh, enterprise. Go ahead. Thank you for your talk and presenting such a comprehensive sort of Saudi view on, on Iran in the region and on the U.S. So my question, I'll try to be quick, um, builds up uh, what Tarek a couple of times mentioned and also this sort of last uh, little debate. I wish there was more time to have back and forth. I obviously um, those of you who read my stuff disagree on the maximum pressure uh, strategy and its effectiveness. But I actually want to want to press you on this a little more in, in uh, using your own responses. And I think there is a contradiction that I'm trying to understand in what you're saying. For me, if you were going to say the maximum pressure uh, strategy is effective and Iran is being, you know, escalating even more and that's the sign of desperation and look at what they're willing to do. They're willing to risk, you just said, a conventional war. So then if, as a part of your other comments, you had said, you think even if it leads to a war, it's still worth, worth the strategy because the end game should be weakening Iran even if it leads to a war then I would have understood your logic. However, if your argument is that war will only have a series of losers and no winners, then I cannot put this two together because as you know, using your argument, it doesn't seem like Iran will in the long run continue to just sit by with the sanctions. And you know, many of their activities could get much worse, including the missiles, which are a huge threat to the to the Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia. 
their advanced technological missiles and more sort of with even more advanced warfare technologies, they're not going to detract from the cost from that, no matter what the sanctions. They're going to let the people die from hunger, but they will not detract from those. So it, that is not going to go away. It's going to make things even worse. A lot of their regional activities are at low cost. So this is not a long game. It's either ending in a conflict or in an Iran that is some version of a North Korea in the region that is not even inward looking. So I, I you know, I, I really want to hear, you know, what is your, as, as Tarek mentioned, what is your best case scenario? Um, and, and how do you square the possibility of war with this maximum strategy that is just- sure. uh, I think that's Thank a good you. question. Uh, I think that's a good question. And, and it, it, it uh, reminds me to some extent about this false binary that we see sometimes in the, in the discourse on Iran. It's either war or do this. It's uh, either war or do that. Uh, you know, it's either JCPOA or war will come after. It's either scale back to maximum pressure or war will come after. We haven't seen war uh, with Iran yet. Uh, is there a risk of conventional war? There is a risk of conventional war. And the reason uh, that Iran and uh, uh, regional actors and the United States are, are uh, taking uh, 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 these policies and implementing them despite the risk is because these are complex situations, multivariable situations. War is not the ideal outcome, but the risk of war is a manageable risk for many regional actors if uh, the alternative is one where uh, uh, a continuation of hundreds of thousands of dead Syrians in Syria or a failed state in Iraq becomes the norm and the reality. So, so risking war, unlikely, unlikely or likely as it may be, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, pre uh, pressuring campaign, uh, pressuring uh, Iran such that it doesn't have the resources to commit the genocide, etc., uh, is, is an acceptable risk. In the same vein, you know, Iran, which has a very weak conventional army that is dated and that does not stand up to, to many armies in the region, uh, shouldn't want and doesn't want conventional war. But it views that escalating in such a way that risks conventional war is an acceptable risk uh, uh, if uh, the reward is uh, a U-turn on maximum pressure that will enable it to get access to uh, the funds that it can use to continue its regional campaign. So there is uh, an acceptance of the risk uh, of conventional war and the calculation of the risk of conventional war on both sides. And that shouldn't, I think, be conflated with, with accepting war or calling for war. Uh, and it's a complex uh, set of uh, complex situation. Uh, we've seen, uh, and it's been documented, what uh, uh, an Iran with a free hand in the region can deliver. You know, there's a huge refugee crisis in Syria that... Uh, has, has affected Europe to a large degree and the United States and the region. There's hundreds of thousands of dead Syrians. There's a Iraq that is teetering on the verge of collapse. It's one of the top oil producing countries in the world uh, that once had the potential to be an economic powerhouse, right now mired with instability, lack of security, uh, uh, and a new generation that's grown up, uh, uh, you know, uneducated uh, uh, and, and you know, suffering from, from state failure. So the, the, the uh, refraining from uh, taking strong uh, policies that limit Iran's ability to act outside Iran uh, has shown uh, us what happened in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria. We know how, how, how problematic that is. Uh, so I think the, the calculus for, for those policymakers is, sure, there is a risk of conventional war. That would be horrible. Uh, but uh, if we uh, uh, implement this in the long run, accepting that risk, the ideal scenario is that uh, Iran loses its physical ability and financial ability uh, to continue uh, its regional campaign. So it is a complicated matter. I agree with you 100% that it's a complicated matter. On the second part of your question, you said that uh, Iran has a low-cost regional activity. I think this is one of the biggest myths that's been perpetuated about Iran and policy circles for a very long time. Sure, uh, one militia is cheaper uh, than, than uh, uh, one arms deal or another uh, uh, that is uh, carried out by one uh, Gulf country or another. But that's just for one militia. You know, when you have over 100 militias, and when uh, you've got uh, 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 you know, weapons that you want to send to these militias, uh, developing ballistic missiles, sending them uh, across oceans in small pieces, sending advisors to militias to assemble these uh, 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 ballistic missiles, paying salaries to militia members that are in direct control of Iran. Maybe the Houthis unpaid salaries, but surely 
militias in Syria, paid salaries in currency by the Iranian regime. The same can apply to militias that are in Iraq, Hezbollah. You know, one militia might be a very small cost, but a hundred or north of a hundred militias, that cost starts adding up. And we're talking about billions upon billions of dollars. Uh, Iran perfected uh, 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 the art of asymmetric warfare, but it has expanded uh, and, and spread itself across uh, uh, other sovereign nations so much that the cost is no longer, uh, uh, the cost structure is no longer as we uh, once uh, used to talk about. That, uh, Iran spends very little, other countries spend a lot. Iran does spend a lot of money because of the sheer size of its region. So I have uh, a, a number of questions that have been uh, sent to me in the chat and on my email, and that is just, in my view, an indication of how uh, not just intrinsically interesting uh, this issue is, but how informed uh, and provocative uh, you were that people want to continue this dialogue and ask you uh, many questions. So. Um, I, I know that you're in Dubai and uh, you've probably just had a very quick opportunity to break your fast uh, before uh, generously joining us on this call. So I want to let you go and and uh, uh, and uh, consume more uh, in preparation for tomorrow. Um, uh, and just thank you for allowing us to consume intellectually what I think has been a, a very insightful and informative talk. Um, so if we were all in the same physical space, you would hear a great deal of respectful applause right now. Uh, in the absence of that, please let me speak on behalf of everybody uh, who attended this to, by uh, thanking you, uh, Mohammed, and uh, hoping that we'll uh, have you join us once again in the future to talk about this and many other issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masoud, and thanks to everybody who asked questions and engaged. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and for such great questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.